The Class 17 is known for its poor performance. The Class 40 for being among the first. The Class 28 for being subject to a successful marketing campaign. Will that end? But the Class 15... What is it known for? Arguably their main contribution to the current enthusiast zeitgeist is that they have perhaps the worst ready-to-run models available in double gauge. But what of the real examples? The first Class 15s weren't known as such, rather they were the British Thompson Houston Type 1. And there's your first clue as to why these locos are seldom remembered. The first 10 BTH Type 1s were delivered in 1957, originally to replace small steam engines working out of East London, though eventually the whole class of 44 would work the Eastern region, the former Great Eastern Railway. And there is your second clue. The BTH Type 1s look unlike any other British diesel locomotive. Well, there is the Class 16, which in reality is just the North British Locomotive Company's take on the Type 1. You see, the Type 1 had a very distinct design philosophy. Here is an English electric Type 1. As you might have picked up on, the various Type 1s are distinguished by their builders. Do you see any similarities between the EE Type 1 and the BTH and North British attempts? They all have long bonnets which house the engine in electrics, a design cue taken specifically from the USA's concept of a road switcher. A road switcher is a shunting or switching locomotive, which is then also capable of hauling the train it has just shunted for long distances. This concept revolutionized the American rail industry as notably, the most successful diesel locomotives around back then had no area for the switcher, that is the actual person standing on the footplate, coupling and uncoupling the freight cars, to stand on. The road switcher had ample space and running place for the shunter to have their footing. And as locomotives used for switching, their visibility had to be greater than a road locomotive, whilst also being capable of taking to the main line or road themselves. Because of this, the cabs usually protrude some way beyond the dimensions of the bonnet. And there's clue number three. And within the short length of this video, I have already given enough hints as to why the Class 15, and many other small diesels like it, don't appear in our collective nostalgia for the era they were built for. Let's walk those clues back. Road switchers usually have a protruding cab to improve visibility. On American locomotive practices, this can be done to sufficient effect. But on a system like the UK's, that is not an option. For this very reason, the Class 15 had horrible visibility, making it decisively unpopular with engine crews who had to look past the long bonnet. The EE Type 1, later to be classified as Class 20, solved this issue by having the cab at one end, so visibility going backwards was great. Forwards, not so much. But then, this was solved by having these locos often working in pairs, nose to nose. Then, there was the matter of the Class 15 being concentrated on the Eastern region. You see, the Eastern region was practically the only place that would have them. Scotland and Yorkshire also needed Type 1s, but those had their Class 17s and Class 20s. In truth, it really only was the Eastern region which needed all types of diesel on the type power scale from 1 to 5. Type 5s being reserved for the northeastern region at that time. The eastern region needed big express locomotives for their Norwich and Ipswich services, for which they got the class 40s and 37s, but for its merry rural lines crossing the expanses of East Anglia and lighter London services, it needed smaller options like the class 15 and 31. But it was these types of services which were affected the most by the beaching cut of the 1960s, with many smaller lines disappearing or their traffic simply going by road by that time. And whilst the Class 31 saw further use on the western region and in the northeast and northwest as a Type 2, for the relatively feeble Type 1, there was not much work to go around, especially not when British Railways had decided that the Class 20 had trumped all the other Type 1 offerings and was to become the standard Type 1. An argument could be made that the Class 15 was better suited to departmental use. Certainly with their route availability of 4, they could work over almost any line. But by the time they were withdrawn from working freight trains in London and East Anglia, the bridges were being strengthened all across the network, the Class 20 had established itself as the faster and more powerful machine, 
and it and even the class 37 had a road availability of 5. Do you keep an underpowered non-standard class 15 maintained for departmental use, or do you use class 20s and 37s instead? I think the answer is quite obvious. Meanwhile, the class 15 could never have lived up to its road switcher nature, as with the lack of footplating and the class 08 shunter being the most produced British diesel locomotive ever with 996 examples, the class 15 always had the short end of the shunter's pole. The first withdrawal of a class 15 happened in April 1968, before steam had even been eliminated from BR's network. The last was withdrawn in March 1971. Four of the class managed to last a while longer as unpowered carriage heating units, finding their way to Scotland and South Wales well into the 1980s, but only one was purchased for preservation. It is currently being overhauled at the East Lancashire Railway. Like the class 26 and 27 for the Type 2, the class 15 mirrors the story of nearly all Type 1s, with the class 20 being the notable exception. Do they deserve to be remembered? As the misstep they were, yes, it is important to learn from failure. Do they have to be part of the enthusiast zeitgeist? I think, controversially, one should be allowed to forget such an unimpactful, short-lived piece of history ever existed. The Class 15. Known for... unexceptionality? <laughs>